Hi, my name is Hannah, and today we are interviewing John. Originally from Ireland, John is based in Portugal and describes himself as an author, speaker, and coach. Today he shared his view on important trends as we emerge into a post-pandemic world. This podcast channel is about you, successful international entrepreneurs, successful expats, successful investors, sponsored by HCJ Contacts. And we're live. Good morning, John. How are you? I'm well, Darren. Thanks for the invite. Awesome. Thanks for sharing your time and expertise. Could you please introduce yourself to those who may be watching us on YouTube or listening to us on the other podcast platforms? Sure. Uh, Well, I've been working as a business coach for about 20 years. And then uh, in the last few years, the significance of self-worth has become uh, very crucial, particularly in its role in building net worth, but also in terms of building business, in terms of building opportunity and um, mental health, just surviving the ups and downs of the economy. And of course, when I started this, I had no idea that a pandemic was it was coming our way. So in 2019, I published a book called The Self-Worth Safari that you know, it's had a certain modest success, shall we say. And on the back of that formed Self-Worth Academy, <clears throat> uh, selfworthacademy.com, in order to train uh, facilitators and associates and people who want to develop self-worth with other people. Uh, and the full significance of that, of course, uh, given the events of 2020, uh, has actually, um, you know, now it's mainstream, <laughs> if mm-hmm. you like. Yeah, you know, you know, you you absolutely correct. One of the unfortunate downsides of what's happening with the lockdowns is you know, mental health challenges. I mean, let's be honest. And in you know, some nations have been, and some cities and some regions have been quite public as to what the numbers look like. I was reading something on Japan, and then we have anecdotes from other regions but then some countries have been a bit shy about publishing it but i think everyone i know knows someone in their network that's been impacted in some way shape or form whether it's the the actual lockdowns or when you're going through quarantine like when you're re-entering somewhere like singapore and you or hong kong and you have to stay in one of the government facilities for two weeks it, it gets to you it gets to you yeah. so i mean what can we do to, to cope with what's happening around us? Well, I think the first thing to uh, ac- is to uh, acknowledge or, or to accept is that, hey, we have a problem, <laughs> you know, which is like, sometimes we feel with all this positive thinking that's around, you know, sometimes we feel, oh, we're supposed to be up every day and mm-hmm. positive and, more, you know, and that's not life. You know, we have, um, we have up days and down days and everybody does and, and anything else is just an act. It's a Hollywood set, you know, and there's a lot of Hollywood sets around of people pretending um, to be fine uh, or uh, to be positive or whatever, whatever else it might be. Um, You know, you've mentioned some of the effects of lockdown. Even before lockdown, we have a very basic human emotion called fear. Uh, You know, at the point at which there are hundreds of thousands of people dying, uh, there is a certain amount of insecurity. It's important that we can talk about that. Uh, In some circles, it's not possible uh, Mm -hmm. because we're supposed to be positive. Um, So at the most basic level, we have people worried about the health of loved ones, of Mm -hmm. people of a certain age or whose immune system is compromised. Mm -hmm. Uh, Acknowledging insecurity, level one. Then we have the fear of what's going to happen my job, what's going to happen my business. You know, if my pipeline has suddenly gone dry, how long is that going to last? Um, that's pretty basic primal fear stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why self-worth becomes really important because we have, we've grown up with this idea of self-esteem. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been the dominant philosophy of two generations now. And self-esteem is notoriously tied to how we're doing at the game of life. 
So if I'm doing well, if the pipeline is full, if my job prospects are good, if I feel good about my relationships, if I feel good about my family situation, not to mention my money situation, then of course, self-esteem is nice. You know, it, mm. it's summertime, <laughs> it grows. Yeah. But right now for many people it's winter. Yeah. And um, you know, the, the leaves are dying and um, things are falling off the tree. And you know, now what becomes important is the roots rather than the branches mm -hmm. and for many people their relationship with themselves is tied to how they're doing at the game of life mm -hmm. so the book the self-worth safari is essentially about the difference between self-worth and self-esteem mm -hmm. uh, because we've been trained in self-esteem mm -hmm. you, you you and i darren were brought up in cultures that privileged self-esteem mm -hmm. no matter what else goes on around us we're meant to think well about ourselves based upon conditions of education of finance of security and suddenly those conditions are changing mm. for everyone mm. so we need to find deep roots that allow us to survive the winter uh, and those deep roots are a sense of unconditional loyalty mm. and friendship with ourselves uh, and that's a big game changer in financial affairs in mm. tax affairs in planning affairs in in uh Business development, I, I work a lot with business development teams. I, I always have, and that's where some of these ideas were born. Um, uh, imagine a salesman going out today in a, in a tough environment. Um, and, you know, for a sales professional, any sales professional is used to dealing with rejection. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, <laughs> it's part of the deal, you, you, you get good at that. Mm -hmm. uh, but also we do tend to judge ourselves based on success. Mm -hmm. um, the monthly numbers, uh, the weekly numbers for some. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, to be able to be loyal to ourselves, even when those numbers are not going the right way, uh, mm -hmm. is a very, um, it represents a very deep root, if you like, that allow the oak tree to survive the winter uh, and to have deep roots that are not reached by the frost. Mm. And of course, that's much more easily said than done because it is a fundamental shift. As you said, this is how we were raised. This is how society yeah. judges us, even if we would not to judge ourselves like this. This yeah. is how others would look at us. How can we pivot? How can we make that 180 degree change? Yeah. Well, I, let's, just, um, let's just tweak that last sentence yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, society is not judging us anywhere near as often as we're judging ourselves. Mm -hmm. right. society judges us now and again sure <laughs> if, if you go for interview someone is judging you yeah. if you uh if you're pitching a proposition to a client yeah there's a moment of judgment going on there yep sure there is but that pales into insignificance mm -hmm. in comparison to the countless hours of day and very often of night mm -hmm. uh, that we're also judging ourselves and it's those self-judgments mm -hmm. that are uh, potentially toxic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and disempowering um the judgments of others as any salesman knows yeah if you're if you're intact with yourself you're teflon coated uh, against uh, a lot of the rest mm. uh, but to your question yeah. uh, you asked how do we change it um well that's what the book is about um in short it's a it's a series of shifts uh, which we apply across six domains of life Mm. So we have to think about our physical selves and how we relate mm -hmm. to our bodies and ourselves. Mm -hmm. We look at our relationships and how we relate to that. We look at career and work and how we think about our services. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a very empowering shift for many career professionals. Um, we look at uh, money and our relationship with money mm -hmm. and and or status, because some people get their status from money. Mm -hmm. Others get their status from other things like education or style or whatever. <clears throat> we look at friendship and we look at how we do environment and leisure. So we take a walk through these six areas and we examine what are the conditions that we're placing on our relationship with ourselves. Right. And that's quite illuminating for many people. Mm -hmm. um, they may find they're very cozy and comfortable in terms of their friendship, but oh my God, they really are craving validation at work. Mm -hmm. 
uh, other people actually feel quite okay about work. You know, when, when they're at work, they're happy. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they have their identity sewn up in one way or another at work until conditions change. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is kind of what happened to me in uh, 2015, uh, sorry, 2016, mm-hmm. um, when uh, I had a very rocky year, both in terms of relationships and in terms of work and in terms of many other things that I had always defined myself by. Right. And what happened in one year is all of them just boom, tumbled together. Yeah. One thing knocking over the other thing. Wow. And I, I felt like a fraud in my in my uh, coaching work uh, because I, I, I did not feel anything of what I was <laughs> extolling other people to do. Um, and that's what led me to understand that, hang on a minute, you know, what are these conditions mm-hmm. that I've been placing on myself and where do they come from? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we start by eliminating those. Um, and we start then looking at seven other shifts. Um, I'll give an example of just one that comes at the end, but it's one that many people are uh, find very useful in business, okay. which is um, to, instead of trying to be interesting, which is what a lot of people do in today's social media world and, and in LinkedIn, and, you know, they're, they're always trying to be interesting doing interesting things, uh, to shift instead to being interested. Mm. When we're interested, you, you're doing things like you're doing right now. You're exploring the changing world and how this is impacting people in business. That's being interested. Mm-hmm. That's very powerful. Mm. That builds relationships. Mm. Yeah, that uh, allows us to discover useful things. Mm-hmm. Uh, that enable us to sell services or reposition our careers or whatever it might be. When people are obsessed with self-esteem, <clears throat> they are obsessed with being interesting. Mm. And that blocks them from the creativity that they need. Mm. Um, that, that instead, if they could be interested, uh, then, then they would actually uncover what they need to, to uncover. Wow. You know that what you said is 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 very very powerful. So I'm going to repeat it. You know, it's about being interested rather than trying to be interesting. And I say that in the context of this whole preoccupation with social media and the number of likes and followers and being an influencer and and, and yeah, and the impact that that's having on the behavior of, of people and particularly younger people, where their self esteem or self worth somehow is tied to their popularity online. And yeah. I think just that, what you said about being interested rather than interesting, that could lead to a shift that would help a lot of people. Yeah, uh, there's, there was a show on Netflix recently about the, you know, one of the many uh, about, uh, you know, the, the impact of social networks on, right. on society and-, and Social and- dilemma. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. yeah, that's some really scary stuff. Do you work with a lot of young people as well, or mostly professionals? We are we are just doing that. We are just right. transitioning. So historically, for twenty years, I've been working with sales teams and self-employed right. independent professionals. You know, I'm a died in the wool business yeah. coach, if you like, yeah. um, with of course all the self-esteem that used to go with that. But mm-hmm. you know, there's another story. And um, but. Since the book was published, we are now being contacted almost every month by uh, an education establishment somewhere, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, university, uh, business school, whatever it might be. Uh, And um, the significance of this with with young people, which to be Mm -hmm. perfectly honest, I was not aware of when I when I wrote the book, uh, dimly aware of, but not it was not front of mind. Mm -hmm. Um, Suddenly, as um, those involved in healthcare at universities are, are now telling me, uh, it's a huge, there's a, a veritable self-esteem crisis with, yeah. with young people. Mm-hmm. Um, it is because of all the expectations, um, the self-expectations and parental expectations mm-hmm. that they are being brought up with. Mm-hmm. And of course, the influence of social media that's like feeding it all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and for students and for young professionals in particular, um, these shifts are very important. Um, to give just one example, we're, we've just been talking about one, interested versus interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it is the seventh one in the book. There's, there's six more you have to do to get to this one. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but it, it's an easy one to talk about, so let, let's stay there. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, if if a young person is looking for a job, for mm-hmm. example, or or an internship, mm-hmm. it's it's very hard for them to go out trying to be interesting. Mm-hmm. Like they're still early in career. What are they going to say that's going to be massively relevant to the company that they're that they're going to see? But if they can go in the door into that interview and they've got a few well prepared questions mm-hmm. that show that they're interested in that, that they've done the research on the website, that they have that that they are aware of the trends in that sector and they're curious about X and Y and Z. Mm-hmm. Doesn't that make a young person stand out? Absolutely. So yeah. In all kinds of practical ways, mm-hmm. self-worth um, empowers uh, a young person to to be curious, mm-hmm. um, to be able to present themselves in better ways, and above all, to recover from setbacks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the uh, one of the stories that always stays with me, um, told to me by a man who works with a UK university mm-hmm. uh, in medical uh, faculty. <clears throat> uh, so everyone that comes in to that medical faculty is already a top student. Yeah. I mean, you have to be. Mm-hmm. in order to get in there uh, it, so they're used to being first in the class in, yeah. in their in their home town or school or whatever and then they come into a university and then suddenly they're number 167 <laughs> oh, wow because everyone else is super smart as well yeah. but their entire identity is now threatened mm. because all through school all through their life to date they have defined themselves as being the smart kid on the block mm-hmm and then suddenly they walk into a, uh, this environment where there's loads of smart kids and they're mm-hmm. suddenly number 160. And it's like, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, you know, this this can turn tragic. And this produces mm-hmm. many uh, cases of self-harm, of addiction, and very tragically, of suicide. Wow. In the UK alone, there is one student suicide every four days. Wow. That's insane. Every four days. Wow. That is quite incredible. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not the bottom of the class that commits suicide. Yeah. Right. These are bright, bright, bright kids with very, very high aspirations. Sure. Now, it's, it's their relationship with the aspirations mm-hmm. that is problematical. Okay. Now, and, and let, let's stay with that for a while with the idea of the struggles of young, the younger part of our population. I remember watching some YouTube videos and one of them went viral, an interview with a guy called Chamat Palihapitiya. He is the first CTO, the chief technical officer of Facebook. So from back in the days, he's employee number whatever, one of the early guys that Mark Zuckerberg brought on board. And he was making it clear that his kids are not allowed to be on Facebook, you know, even though he became a billionaire as a result of exiting um, that, that situation, his kids are not allowed. And he has interestingly been in support of uh, stricter regulation and social media and probably breaking up the social media giants. So, I mean, is, what are your views on that? Are you thinking that, maybe there should be stricter controls or, you know, what are are your thoughts? Well, my key thought would be let's deal with the root causes rather than the surface level conditions. I see. You know, why is Facebook so addictive? Mm -hmm. If we think about it a little bit, why did it take off in the first place? Mm -hmm. It took off because of our self-preoccupation with Mm self-esteem. Yeah. If we hadn't been so preoccupied with what others were thinking about us, and if we hadn't been so preoccupied yeah. about how well we look in the first place, then yeah. a lot of these issues would not be happening. So the, the yeah. danger with regulating Facebook is that we're actually missing the fundamental issue. Mm. Uh, the, the fundamental issue, as I tried to describe it here, mm-hmm. is our self-preoccupation. Mm-hmm. Unnecessary. So I, I'm not talking about healthy self-care. That's mm-hmm. a whole different uh, mm-hmm. ballgame. Uh, but that unnecessary self-preoccupation with how am I doing? Yeah. That yeah. constant narrative of self-assessment and self-appraisal mm-hmm. that we have that we're indoctrinated into both mm-hmm. by society and by education. And those adjectives are literally killing us. Mm. If we deal with that, then mm-hmm. social media is just another tool. It's uh, it ceases to become a problem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have yeah. So I'm not sure that regulating 
um, Facebook, if indeed it were possible. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure that it would actually help us very much because mm -hmm. all that would happen is their self preoccupation would sprout in other ways. Exactly. I see what you mean. Oh. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Now, obviously, you know, we're, we're human beings, so therefore we're social animals. We sure. thrive on interaction and, and being in touch with, with people, right? Sure. Now, one of the, we, we spoke a bit about lockdowns, but there's a whole work from home uh, trend. And then there are those who believe that it will survive even after lockdowns. People continue to work remotely because companies see, you know, companies are looking for what's in their best interest. They can save money by having, uh, you know, they can cut rents, they can cut a whole bunch of stuff. What do you see as the, you know, the pros and cons of that remote work? Well, it's not going away. Um, I mean, I've been remote working for 20 years. So for me, it's like, -da, you know, Groundhog Day. <laughs> um, so um, although, to be fair, that's, again, let me just um, correct that. Yes, I've been remote working for 20 years, as in the medium we're on now, Darren, is not, is not new to me. You know, I was on, I've been working, uh, I've been teleworking for so long that I can't actually remember what the other kind looked like. Um, however, I still had business conferences to go to and I still had business events where I could meet people and there were after work cocktails and there were client gatherings and there was all, there was a whole ecosystem of uh, connection around it um, that actually uh, has now, of course, been seriously undermined. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I, I think we have to look not just at how are we conducting our meetings? I mean, that's, you know, us talking to each other as little square boxes on Zoom is mm -hmm. uh, is one part of the experience. Yeah. But I think I think what we are now seeing mm -hmm. is that a lot of the surrounding ecosystem has changed. Yeah. So there aren't the team gatherings to go to, and there are, isn't the leadership conference in uh, September, November, or whatever it was. There isn't the um, you know the new the christmas parties and the new year parties mm -hmm. um there are even the birthday parties mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. um uh, weddings you know all the things that people uh, that prompted people to get together of course yeah. in lockdown these are removed so it it's not it's not just how you know how are, how is life different because we're doing this face to face rather than over a cup of coffee uh, and a microphone um, that's that's one part of the experience but what happens when people are spending prolonged time on their own and of course once again our relationship with self does come rather sharply in sure. for yeah you know in in the book the the self worth safari um two key chapters are about our relationships mm. Literally, a third of the book uh, is about our relationships, our relationships uh, within a family and um, loved and romantic relationships, and also our relationships with friends. Right. Yeah. Now, what's happening right now is that um, so many people are feeling a sense of disconnection. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Maybe their friends are in other countries. Maybe their family members are in other countries. And even if they want to, they cannot go and see them because of quarantine. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're driven back onto our relationship with ourselves mm -hmm. in ways that we have never seen in living memory mm -hmm. um, i don't think that is an exaggeration yeah. uh, our, our sense of friendship with ourselves is now utterly utterly fundamental um, to get through the um the winter season <laughs> that we're in mm -hmm. Mm. So I, I would imagine, of course, for many companies, having some sort of like employee assistance program has been, you know, a way of doing things. I would imagine now that it, sh it will probably be getting greater focus and emphasis. And perhaps that that area of support will actually be on the increase. You know, maybe yeah. you have, don't wait until something goes wrong, but let's have a checkup, you Good. know. A checkup. So I, I can see things like that happening and being of real value as, as we adjust to whatever this so called new normal may be. Yeah. 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 I would <clears throat> simply add one caveat. Um, yeah. There is a danger okay. uh, when, when companies move into the mental health space mm -hmm. that they move into it with the dominant philosophy of the time 
and mm. which right now is very much positive psychology. Mm-hmm. It's very much around positive self appraisal, and it's very much around you know being able to turn every negative experience into a positive experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That all sounds good, um, mm-hmm. and it's certainly better than a lack of support. Mm-hmm. But sadly, it also adds to the problem. Adds to the it, problem. How so? It adds to the problem because now, as well as being able to uh, deal with the issues of isolation and loneliness, I'm now somehow expected to be able to turn all my negative experiences into positive experiences. Mm. <clears throat> and if if we are going to do these programs, um, mm. or if we are going to do these mental health initiatives, let's do it in a way that supports unconditional friendship mm-hmm. with each person, rather than adding yet another set of conditions mm. onto their rather overloaded um, set of criteria uh, for being a good friend to themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not saying that you know self-worth is the only game in town, but mm-hmm. it sure as hell is a very important foundation for, for mental health. Mm-hmm. And a lot of what's out there is self-esteem based rather than self-worth based. Mm. And that's reinforcing the habits of positive self-appraisal all mm-hmm. the time and almost an inadmissibility in some cases. Mm-hmm. Like in some companies, you cannot admit to having a down day. Yeah, yeah. That's toxic. That's not helping. Sure, sure. Uh, and if I, uh, sorry, go ahead. If I have to show up faking this hmm. Hollywood set every day on Zoom, yeah, you know, uh, reassuring my boss and everyone else that I, yeah, I've, uh, you know, I, I'm not bothered by that rejection yesterday. It's okay. I, you know, I'm yeah. on my game. Mm-hmm. Like, human beings are not like that. We, we, we need to be able to be true and authentic with each yeah. other, mm-hmm. and that in turn presupposes we can come home to ourselves. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't have a home to come home to because they, they are so obsessed with these labels and they're so obsessed with these positive appraisals that's literally killing them. Right. And then I guess, you know, that kind of touches on like uh, privacy issues as well. You know, yeah. the, whatever session you may have with whoever the facilitator may be, can your employer use that against you? You know, it's... It is a a, a tricky situation indeed, yeah. It is, it is. There's a lot of employees do not want employers poking into their mental health. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And I fully get that. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we do, even if conducted by a third party, they still Mm -hmm. resent the intrusion, if you like, into a Mm -hmm. private space, um, which is why I, uh, in any of the work that we do with with companies and with teams, uh, mm-hmm. we actually urge them to do their own work uh, as much as possible. We share resources with them that allow them to do their own work. And if they want to reach out for support, that's cool. Mm-hmm. But actually, there's no expectation that they should do so. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> there is, furthermore, the the reassurance that we want to give people that actually they're okay already. Mm-hmm. You don't actually need to fix anything. Mm. Uh, This is the other problem with these improvement programs is there's an inbuilt assumption Mm -hmm. that you need to develop something, that you're not okay. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. we're a bit counterculture on this one and that the starting point of the program is you are actually okay already. Mm Self-worth is something you discover. It's not something you build. Mm -hmm. It's not even something you develop. Uh, You actually uncover an intrinsic state that's already there just sometimes we have a bit of difficulty seeing it. Mm. I, I see what you mean, but you know, there are coaches who make, who appear, well, you never know, right? Who appear to make a whole lot of money and they have very high profile, high, high performance uh, yep. clients. And, you know, they, they establish themselves as those performance coaches. So I guess that's where it may, you know, find its origin. The idea that, hey, you know, even if it's a short-term fix, just to get whoever that salesperson, that especially in financial services, that trader, get them psyched up, get them feeling empowered and put them back into the, into the center of the, the, trading, the trading room, wherever that may be, mm-hmm. to make money. It works. It works. Yep. I- 
Darren, I was one. <laughs> <laughs> like I used to. That's what I used yeah. to do. And to some extent, I still do. I'm not against performance. Right. Um, on the contrary. Um, mm. But um, but here's the thing. What fuel do we want to be running on? Do mm. we want to be running on a sugar diet that, yeah, gives that instant hit of energy? And mm. yeah, you do the you do that next meeting or you do that next client contact with a, a lot of razzmatazz. Um, <clears throat> And you know, I used to speak at sales conferences. You can imagine what the uh, what the environment was like. Um, okay, great. You know, we can do that, or we can put people onto a more sustainable source of fuel that will allow them to not only perform but to run marathons, and mm -hmm. not just to run a hundred yards, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore that they'll still be able to do it next year and the following year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that with self worth versus self esteem, we're just talking about switching fuel source. Mm. We're, we're not we're not talking about in any way diluting performance uh, on the contrary mm -hmm. uh, true self-worth gives people resilience and adds performance because they're not burning up energy trying to prove things to themselves all the time right yeah. okay so this is not yeah, yeah. no you finished but, sorry this is well this is not about diluting values of excellence or of high quality on the contrary we mm -hmm. do want to strive for high achievement mm -hmm. But it's, it's just going there with a fuel source that will allow that to be sustainable mm -hmm. uh, rather than burning ourselves out on the, um, you know, in the next three months. Mm. Okay, I'm with you now. So when you go online, for example, I spend a lot of time watching YouTube videos and there's so many ads that pop up in between with people offering courses, they're offering books, they're offering whatever whether it's, you know, performance coaching or, you know, turning into the best salesperson or changing your attitude, you're going to be super positive. How can someone determine which course, uh, which course or course of action would be best for them when they're faced with so many alternatives in front of them? <clears throat> Indeed. A great question because, um, even now in 2020, even while other industries are locked down, et cetera, we are seeing a veritable explosion yeah. uh, in, in that uh, domain. I mean, my, uh, my news feeds are just haunted now with high performance X, Y, Z, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you said right at the beginning, or when you said a few, a few sentences ago, uh, there's a lot of money being made at this. Mm -hmm. I think we have to take a step back and go, hey, there really is. You know, we're in a, um, what, what, the, what the gyms and fitness industry was doing to our physical bodies mm -hmm. only three, five years ago, as in telling us we weren't good enough unless we achieved X, Y, Z standard. We now have that pretty much moving into the attitude space. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have an awful lot of people with a vested interest mm -hmm. in your dissatisfaction with you. Mm -hmm because that's the foundation upon which sales get built. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the starting point for an awful lot of um, these courses is mm -hmm. cultivating a sense of frustration and cultivating a sense of dissatisfaction. Yes. Uh, and that's deliberately done. Mm -hmm. And these are very, very skillful operators and they know how to do it. Um, mm -hmm. So I would take a real good, healthy look at that before embarking on anything mm -hmm. and ask yourself, you know, are you doing it? Mm -hmm. uh, as an expression of self-worth mm -hmm. as in do you really value yourself and you are doing this as an expression of that or are you doing it to fulfill mm -hmm. yet another condition of self-esteem mm -hmm. now that might save you many tens of thousands of dollars uh, because some of these are not cheap exactly um uh, and uh the book by the way is only about 15 dollars <laughs> <laughs> no i'm not i'm, I'm not uh, cynically inserting a sale into that process but i'm i am saying you know are we doing these things because we're happy with ourselves already mm -hmm. and we want to build on that strength as a in a free sense of choice mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or are we doing it because we're dissatisfied with ourselves and we're trying to fix that with another course or qualification. Mm. So I can tell you now that the course, the qualification will not fix it. Mm. No matter what it is, it yeah. is not going to fix it. Uh, because that state of dissatisfaction with self is an intrinsic state. And, and that, you know, one of the, um, one of the byproducts of working on self-worth, or as I said earlier, discovering it, because mm. you don't have to work on it. You actually have it. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't mean you. I mean anyone watching this. You sure. you, yeah. you actually have it. You you're not. Um, this is not something you have to build. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just like the sun when the clouds roll over. Sometimes we we cannot see it. Mm-hmm. Um, but when people actually are coming from that place of self worth, they make much better investments because they're doing things that they really want to do rather than they should do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, that has saved quite a, you know i'm thinking of one lady who saved seventy thousand bucks mm-hmm. by understanding that she didn't need to join that franchise in order to run a successful coaching business right seventy thousand right. is a lot of money that is a <laughs> lot of money no matter yeah no matter where you sit in the socioeconomic pyramid definitely that's a huge investment yeah John, thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights. Any final words to any, to the viewers and the listeners? Um, I believe we're living uh, in a strange way at a privileged time. Yeah. Uh, this we are the people who will be able to tell our, you know, children and grandchildren that we uh, we, we remember the COVID time. No. We will be talking about this like our grandparents were talking about the war years or whatever. Um, let's really use it to deepen our relationship with ourselves. Mm-hmm. Whatever story we're telling um, to children or grandchildren mm-hmm. uh, will be more powerful if we can be friends with ourselves in the process. Mm. Um, so um, real Thank you for the for the invitation, and uh, I hope some of your readers might be tempted to uh, to get the book. It's on Amazon, uh, Self Worth Safari. Absolutely, John Speaker, uh, coach, author of Self Worth Academy. Thank you for your time, and yes, we will encourage anyone who may be interested in what was discussed to check out your book on Amazon. And your website is selfworthacademy.com selfworthacademy.com easy to find john thank you very much have a great day thanks sir you too bye please subscribe like share and comment below our books and upcoming events are available at htj.tax email us at help at htj.tax to engage us to advise on international tax or business matters.